Good morning, everybody. Um, my name's Natalia Conde. I run, um, I'm a member of civil society, the, the last panelist Mr. Mundy was speaking about. So we are a public sector responsible AI team and we really focus and specialize in product policy. So much of what you've heard in the last panel, for example, with medical, with medical technology, we would look at that workflow and we would look at that engineering process and then look for areas of potential ethical concern. We would look for areas where we want to comply with all existing laws and as um, as technology scale, that's obviously a crop on globally. And then we would also look for opportunities because we do believe that part of the innovation life cycle is that you are sending out safe, responsible, ethical technologies into the marketplace. So as CEO and founder of AI for the People, what are the key objectives of that organization? We're really looking to um, work with governments to make sure that as these conversations are going on, we do some of that impact assessment work that was uh, described as being a deficit within um, bio the bioethics field. So our key question is, looking at the AI product lifecycle, what will this technology actually do in the wild? And better still, what is the possible misuse of this technology? And I think one of the most famous that we all know was certainly with Facebook, where you think about this idea of going fast and breaking things, and then we break democratic governments across the world. I don't know that that was the intention, but had we had an impact assessment, that's something that we could have potentially looked at and then uh, mitigated against. So that's a really great example. And I was wondering if you could share some other examples of ethical considerations that should be integrated into AI development. Yeah, so last week I was part of one of Senator Schumer's um, AI Insights panel. And we were specifically looking within that session at privacy and liability. So as we think about privacy, I think one of the things that the investment community and the AI community are really excited about is this idea of personalization. But in order to personalize products, we have to give up so much personal data that isn't just ours as individual, but then individuals, but then it becomes an aggregate pool of data for which there is no governance system. So one of the things that we were looking at in that particular context was actually advertising. I know that that's coming up later and thinking about how what we call fog data. So they collect everything about you to do a particular thing, but everything that's left over could be used at any other point and turned into another technology. What, what do we do with that? Is that something that we want to collect? How do we protect innovation? Because we don't want to say stop collecting data because what we're then saying is stop developing AI. That's not a national priority because China and other governments are gonna keep doing it. But how do we do that in such a way that that data isn't gonna be repurposed? Because I think one of the things that Mr. Mundy said really clearly was that we are engineering for the center. We're not thinking of use cases at the margins of the margins. And that's where things are really sticky. Yeah. So you've been very involved in AI policy and I was wondering if you could elaborate on your experience as an AI policy advisor and how you have seen the landscape of AI policy evolve over the past Okay, um, I'm just checking to see if this is alcohol. <laughs> 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 policy, okay. Um, so, the, we, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely an optimistic person. So, kind of started that career um, in, the last, in the last government. So, just to get, just a level set, uh, we were dealing with um, Paul Ryan, the speaker, Mitch McConnell and Trump, not that this is a political thing, but I was also then going in and basically saying, don't make AI racist. And they were just all looking at me and being like, it's not racist, go away, stop bothering us um, and find something better to do with your time. So that's how, that's how that started. But what we were able to do from that position was really galvanized a lot of the work that was going on. Um, I was at Harvard at the time and um, with colleagues at Stanford and MIT that were looking at the margins of the margins and then not just looking at the margins of the margins, but thinking about things like facial recognition. If we capture your face, 
most people have one face. What then happens to that data if it's not recognizing particular groups of people, people with darker skin, and then it's a, and then it's a policing technology? What is really the implication? implications. And we were able to introduce the Algorithmic Accountability Act. And this was the first time that we talked about impact, that we can be, it, it, we're not living in a world where the machines are just going to take over and then they're just going to start, you know, governing themselves and then we don't need, hu that's not happening. What can we do as creators of these machines to govern them? And the analogy I always give is that when we invented the fork, we did not cut off our hands. So why are we so willing to inv invent this technology and then give away um, our decision-making power? And then that kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, started the ball rolling alongside January 6th happening and then how algorithmic systems and platform companies were responsible for some of those groups, that those messages fermented, open AI happened, right? All of this, so as I think the news cycle caught up to the fact that AI is a thing, the governance conversation matured and changed. And we're kind of in this place where government wants to know what the technology is gonna do and that it's compliant. Government also wants to know that this is gonna be profitable and that we are going to outstrip our competitors. I think I'm a new American, I became an, Amer an American in 2020, but the intellectual property that we have in this country is unparalleled, so how can we put it towards these problems? And then I think we want opportunities. I mean, America's a capitalist country and people wanna get rich, so how are we gonna get rich from this? And then how are we gonna be richer than everybody else? That's kind of uh, my read on what they're saying. Mm -hmm. So can we circle back a little bit to the impact of the Algorithmic Accountability Act? Yes. And what that mm -hmm. actually provided? Yes, so with the Algorithmic Accountability Act, it provided three basic things. Number one, the algorithms are techn techno-social, uh, which is an academic word and not easy to say. But um, what that basically means is that yes, it is a technology, but we then have to think about its impacts in the same way we think about uh, seatbelts. You know, or the way the same way we think about foods and drugs, like these are things that can be governed because they have an impact on the American people. Second, that we have the brain power and the capacity to understand these impacts, and that we have to start centering what that means at the margins of the margins. So, what does this mean for women? What does this mean for people of color? What does this mean for poor people? What does this mean? And the reason those groups become so um, pivotal as we think about research and development is that that's where the friction lies. There is very little friction for people whose lives are already easy. So let's think about that. And then I think what the third thing that uh, uh, Algorithmic Accountability Act did globally in terms of our standing on these issues is that America was prepared to act. And at that time, Europe, which is a very heavy regulation environment, were already uh, very far ahead. But what does it look like in a low touch regulation space to come in and start creating these norms, which will be global norms? So as a business developing AI, what does the um, Algorithmic Accountability Act force you to do while developing your product? It really forces at the, at the testing and validation stage of the engineering workflow to add additional steps. And this is something that we speak to LPs and VCs all the time because our strategy is don't go to the startup because we want innovation. We need to go to the top of the cap table and then we need to set standards there. So rather than forcing startups to get to uh, uh, market penetration at such a stage, if something like the Algorithmic Accountability Act, and I should say the norms of this act are being adopted across the board, so it's not just this one policy, but if this impact assessment is gonna take place, then you have to do a number of different things. You have to first anticipate what's gonna happen across the product life, life cycle. And that means you have to diversify your teams. I heard in the last panel that it's absolutely impossible to anticipate every problem. But if you have different types of human beings with different experiences and different types of problems, that's a very easy fix for that problem. The next thing that they would have to do is then decide what to govern. 
if something is low stakes, I don't think that anybody's talking about heavy regulation for um, an AI technology that's regenerating kidneys, right? I think that we all agree that that's a great use case. But if we are creating weapons, <laughs> then maybe we want to regulate that. So then becoming domain specific. Or maybe even deciding who gets those generated kidneys as well. Who get, Well, that's where the governance question would come in. Is It's who gets the kidney, what are the inputs for that? Um, in the medical field, one of the things that you'll often find is that um, AI systems are optimized for cost. And it actually, in aggregate, costs more to treat black people because black people are less likely to have health care in the first place. They're showing up sicker. They need different types of help. This is in aggregate, not everybody. Therefore, they're less likely by AI systems in the way that we're training them right now to get that care. And there's huge amounts of peer review data around that. So that's where the governance case would come in. And then lastly, we need to, I wrote an article for Harvard Business Review in 2019, and my basic argument was your, um, your marketing point could be being a responsible AI um, company. And everybody laughed at this. They were like, oh my God, Debbie Downer, here she comes again with trying to make things good. She doesn't want us to make any money. And the only company that wrote back to me were Apple. And the reason that I got an email from Apple's marketing team and I ended up uh, doing some work with them was that their point of market difference is their privacy policy. And they were saying, we understood, Tim, Tim Cook understood early that by protecting people's privacy, you also protect your consumer. And I think that's what, that's what I would want folks at the top of the cap table to optimize for and to look for in their startups. Yeah. And AI for the People works as an advisor in a couple of different capacities. Yeah. And you, by no means, don't want people to make money off of this. So I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. But AI for the People advises limited partners in the funding community on integrating ethical approaches to AI development. What specific challenges do you see in achieving this integration? And how do you address those? Usually, it's the, it's the size of the investors. So institutional investors. Um, <clears throat> usually don't have a problem like this. So if you're speaking, I don't know, to the investment board at Harvard, they're already aware. I'm not saying that they do this, by the way. I'm just saying that they are aware. They're Nobody's all, getting sued. It's OK. I, um, I mean, who isn't? <laughs> but, you know, um, but they at least have the language around ethics here. And, the, and these are real questions as we look at um, our political, you know, our, our political landscape. Family offices, depending on which family office you are, they may be optimized to make investment decisions that they, are, they believe that their family wants to advance good. But you, I think where we get friction is where we're in funding communities where all they want is capitalization. And there's just no way to move that forward. So what we have to do is to move the market forward and to move the governance forward and then drag them along. You are a very effective communicator in this space. And I was wondering if you have any specific techniques when addressing a very broad audience on this subject. Um, I, th I think you just have to keep it very simple. I think that there is many of us in my space really want you to believe that we're the smartest people on Earth. Take it from me. I have worked in all the major companies. I have, I'm Ivy League to the, to the ground. Not so. Um, I think what you have to do is, is to make people understand three basic things. AI technologies is a form of computing. That's where the machine comes in. They are trained. These are not innate. They do not have values. They do not have politics. The outputs that they have are due to the way that they're trained by people who are imperfect. And we train our imperfections into those systems. And they can process, they can think faster than anything that we have ever known. This is a tremendous opportunity, and there is the tremendous opportunity to get it right. And I think if you just kind of stay in those three places, then the audience will take you deeper. And AI for the People is definitely involved in the latter case of trying to get it right. And one of the ways you guys are doing that is by partnering or advising the UN Business Technology Project. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that partnership and how that organization is shaping global AI policies. Yeah, so the um, UN Business and Technology Project is part of the Human Rights Council. And basically what they decided was that they were going to create a partnership across 
all major platform companies, and then they were looking at three or four, in the US at least, three or four key partners in civil society that have a particular niche. And what, we'll, what we did when um, OpenAI was so, uh, so hugely adopted was thinking about when you have an AI system that has the capacity to generate something else, how do we deal with these friction points? How do we deal with potential bad use cases? Then how do we create those standards and then communicate to government? And I think one of the most interesting things, at least for me, is interfacing with colleagues that are not from democracies. So my colleagues from Singapore, my colleagues from China, my colleagues across the MENA system, where when they think about how they're governing their systems, it's very, very top down. Whereas the beauty of our system is that you can get people from the ground up to create standards. Um, and I'm behind NDA, so that's all, that's it. <laughs> Um, it, so I want to focus in a little bit more on some of the challenges that you're currently working to address. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could share with us, I know we're running out of time, but what are a couple of the top most pressing ethical challenges facing AI development today? And how can policymakers address those effectively? I would say that we're running out, so I'll only speak about privacy. I would say that the biggest challenge that we're facing is um, creating this balancing act between maintaining privacy of the individual and aggregate privacy and development. As it stands, we could have third party data brokers that could buy all our American data and then sell it to, our, to, to hostile nations. That is a huge problem. I know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a big one, it, you know, it's not small. Um, and that's a huge crisis, so it's not does somebody know that I'm coming to their door because of my ring doorbell? Or is my voice being captured because the bank randomly wants to capture my voice? Don't do that, say no. There's no reason for that. These are banks, they don't need your voice. Don't do it. But these are much, much bigger pressing concerns because if they have our data, then what, what are they doing with it? And I think the way that we're trying to parse that out is developing rules that will be protective, but developing rules that are not going to inhibit. Because the last thing that we want to do is inhibit. And then on top of that, not everybody has equal access to privacy. If you are um, in a situation where you are on government subsidy for whatever reason, or you, you are involved in a governmental process, your data is already held by that. There's nothing protecting it. If you are a social media user, you're already giving away your data. There's nothing protecting it. And are there cases for when people actually want to sell their data, share their data, trade their data? We still, I don't think, have quite understood. Like, everybody might not be me. I'm very protective of my data. But if you're not, this is a free country, and you should have that right to figure out how you deal with I it. I think there's a little bit of a joke of like, ah, oh, they can have they can have my data. It's fine. I'm getting, you know, cookie ads and all of that stuff. And But it's actually a very serious problem yeah. when you take it at scale. It's a huge problem when you take it at scale. And I think for practitioners, I'll never forget, I signed up to a gym, and I went. And they were like, hi, Sally. And I was like, Hi, and then I realized I'd used a completely different name, completely different address, <laughs> completely, because, I, because I just felt, when I looked at the questionnaire, as somebody who builds these products, I did not know why for me to go and do a squat, they needed all of this information. <laughs> I was like, I don't think so. Oh my gosh. So we talked a little bit about the intersection of policy and AI development, and we're running, we don't have that much time left, but I was wondering what you would tell individuals and investors about how to stay on top of these trends and help push the needle forward. Uh, the last thing I would say, certainly to anybody and investors included, is that if you are optimizing to get your product into every single person's hand, then make it safe for every single person. And make sure that the people that you invest in are asking those key questions. Thank you so much, Mutali.